Hey guys, good afternoon. Today we are going to continue our lecture on the treatment of Japanese populations in the Americas, focusing in particular on Canada. Uh, last time we talked about how the Japanese Americans were interred in um, internment camps uh, throughout portions of the United States, how essentially their civil rights were violated, and in many instances, in several instances, um, their property was taken, their business is taken. Um, there are arguments by historians, in fact, that some of this was uh, due to the fact that they were, Japanese Americans were competing with Americans, especially in California and other farming areas and communities. Um, and they, these Japanese Americans were competing directly with other farmers. And the removal of the, of the Japanese into internment camps allowed other Americans to flourish. The other issues we talked about were racism and fear as a means to remove and inter Japanese Americans under Roosevelt's executive order in order to, quote, protect the United States. We also concluded that, and many of you concluded, according to OPVLs and other things, that um, this was mainly due to fear, um, mainly due to racism, and the end result is, as we know historically, that there were Caucasian people who posed a direct threat by working with the Japanese um, government, but we know of directly no Japanese individuals working directly with the Japanese government who posed a direct threat to the United States. So in continuing, continuing with this, we're going to talk about the treatment of Japanese Canadians at the, at the beginning of Canada's involvement in the war in 1939, there were about 23,000 Canadians of Japanese ancestry in British Columbia. Of this total, about 13,000 were born in Canada. Actions against the Japanese Canadian population were taken after the attack on Pearl Harbor. However, previously before the attack on Pearl Harbor, there were anti-Japanese sentiments um, that were prevalent throughout um, society in Canada. So it, it seems as if the, um, the issue with Pearl Harbor, the attack on Pearl Harbor, created sort of another spark that added to the fire that was already begin, that, was, that had already begun with regards to um, discrimination and racism against Japanese in Canada. Japanese, um, <coughs> Canadians after Pearl Harbor didn't see did see an increase in discrimination and racism and violence. Buddhist temples were destroyed. Um, many companies that employed Japanese workers began to fire their Japanese uh, Canadian employees. Um, there were rampant fears of espionage um, and rampant fears of sabotage. So essentially the same things that fueled the internment of Japanese Americans are fueling the internment of Japanese Canadians. On the 24th of February, 1942, a hundred mile, mile wide strip inland from the Pacific was uh, created. In this strip inland, all Japanese men between the ages of 18 and 45 five years of age um, were essentially removed and sent to camps within the interior of Canada. Speculation is, is that this um, created uh, having Japanese populations close to Pacific, the, the Pacific coast or the Pacific area um, created fear for Canadian populations. There was a concern that they would be working closely um, and had close access to the Pacific, i.e. Um, to um, Japan potentially sabotage, uh, um, there would be the potential of sabotage and also espionage. These men were removed to camps further inland into Canada. Ten camps, in fact, were set up to house the internees. If internees wished to leave a camp, they could do so, but they could not work or they could not go to school. With no means to exist, Remaining in the camps was the only realistic option. They could not own land, and if they were able to lease land, they would have to pay extremely high rents. 
excuse me, they also had to apply for special licenses to um, engage in, um, for example, growing certain crops and um, it's still engaging in certain businesses. Initially, some of the male Japanese Canadians were sent to work on road construction projects in the interior of British Columbia. Some worked on farms on the prairies because of the labor shortage. If they worked on the sugar beet farms, males were allowed to have their families with them. Those who did not work were sent to internment camps specifically in Ontario. Women and children were moved to six inland camps set up to house the relocated populace. The living conditions were so poor that when Japanese citizens heard about them, they sent food shipments through the Red Cross. During the period of detention, the Canadian government spent one third of the amount of money that the American government spent on interring Japanese Americans. So, there were some extreme conditions in which, in which these Japanese Canadians were interred in Canada. Um, there are reports that in some of the camps, the temperatures reached um, negative 60 degrees Celsius. Um, and they were living in huts with no insulation. Uh, even with stoves burning inside to keep them warm, um, many of these Japanese Canadians were freezing, the conditions were um, extremely poor, and there was really nothing done by the Canadian government at the time to rectify the situation. So <laughs> the government stated that um, those in the camps could leave if they had permission but were not allowed to take up work or to go to school. We already established that. In 1943, the Canadian government introduced a custodian of aliens measure, whereby all the Japanese property which had been under protective custody during the previous years was to be sold off. So in a similar manner, much of the property that was um, taken over uh, by the Canadian government was put, was told to the Japanese Canadians that it, that it would be put in trust, that would be kept for them, but instead it was sold off, including businesses, including clothing, including um, furniture. It was sold off for a very low sum of money. So these Japanese populations lost everything as they were interred by the Canadian government. They also, in this instance, lost money in their bank accounts and stocks and shares were confiscated. When everything was sold, the prices, as I mentioned, were at rock bottom. So none of the Japanese saw this money. Um, the Japanese Canadians saw this money and remember they were promised that this would be kept in trust and that was not done to them by the Canadian government. The Canadian government argued that, hey, we use some of this money raised from the sale of the property for running the internment of camps, but as we've talked about, this is these conditions were terrible. Um, at the same time, as we pointed out, in our last lecture, many of the Japanese Americans were pointing out why aren't we're at war with um, uh, Italy? We're at war with Germany. Why are we not? In, why are Germans and Italians not being interred? The same argument was put forward by Japanese Canadians who said, "Wait a minute, what is it that we've done that we're put in internment camps, and then you have all these other populations walking around like Germans and Italians?" And we're at war with them too. Why is it that we pose a bigger threat? And as we've talked about, the arguments are, of course, that there is a growing, there has been already a rooted fear um, towards uh, Japanese Americans, as we said before, and also incidentally, um, Japanese Canadians, because of course they were quote different. They didn't fit um, the traditional mold. Religious beliefs were different. Um, and they were, um, and what essentially it boils down to is that many Americans and Canadians were um, essentially racist, as we've said before. <coughs> in fact, an extract from a statement to the press in December of 1941 by Ian King, a British Columbian politician and government minister, said the following. It is my personal intention, as long as I remain in public life, to see they never come back here. Let our slogan be for British Columbia, no Japs from the Rockies to the seas. 
So even from the lower rungs of society in Canada to high level politicians, the the mantra or the ideology was that um, we are not we are not um, embracing um, Japanese Japanese people. In fact, it was the exact opposite. Uh, many uh, British Columbians, the British Columbian government, were saying essentially that no, these people do not belong, and they are not a part of our society. It's an extremely racist um, statement by a governmental official. But we already know also that that many Japanese Canadians had experienced racism as well in um, Canada. By the end of the war. Of the 22,000 Japanese Canadians placed in the internment camps, 4,000 were stripped of their Canadian citizen, citizenship and deported to Japan. <coughs> there was a public protest which argued that Canadian policy was a crime against humanity and that a citizen could not be deported from their own country. And in fact, because of this outcry, um, the policy was stopped in 1947. But to be a Canadian citizen, to be interred, and then to be deported, um, many Canadians at this point after the war were extremely upset. Um, in fact, as I mentioned, so much so the policy was stopped and changed in 1947. On April 1st, 1949, the Canadian government announced that Japanese Canadians could live anywhere in Canada. However, most of the surviving internees decided not to return to British Columbia. In the following year, compensations of 1.3 million were awarded to 1,434 Japanese Canadians for damages to property, but the government refused to award any compensation for civil rights violations. In 1988, in a very similar manner, just like we saw in the United States, 46 years after the first Japanese internment camps, Japanese Canadians were compensated for all they had experienced during the war. This compensation package was put forward with the amount of $12 million for each surviving internee, which was a total of $21,000 for each surviving internee. Which if you think about all that was lost, is that really, can you put a number on that? Can you put a price on that? It's a very low sum of money. The harsh treatment of Japanese immigrants and their Canadian or U.S.-born descendants clearly displayed the racist attitudes of the Canadian and the U.S. government. Initial xenophobia, then a fear of espionage and even sabotage led to governmental policies. For some people, the harsh treatment was means of restricting the economic power of both Japanese Americans and Japanese Canadians and acquiring their possessions, their land, their businesses at a very low cost. In Canada, Prime Minister King was also politically motivated. He sought to win votes in British Columbia specifically where there was an open anti-Japanese feeling. So interning Japanese Canadians meant that Prime Minister King would get himself a number of votes from that area. There was no real debate about the withdrawal of basic human and civil rights at the time. When the war finished, apologies and recompense and redress were given grudgingly and over a period of years. Both Japanese Americans and Japanese Canadians suffered the same types of government restriction and unlawful policies. Internment, and especially that the majority of internees were American or Canadian citizens by birth, is the most well-known example. But there are other lesser-known aspects, such as enforced repatriation. Re Enforced repatriation sorry, to Japan by Canada or the expulsion of Japanese Peruvians to the U.S., which are equally important to consider. So now we have looked at two areas in the Americas in which Japanese populations, citizens of these particular countries, were um, taken and stripped of their civil rights. They were taken and stripped of their businesses, their lands, everything that they owned and worked hard for, placed in internment camps for nothing more than fear and racism. Um, 
And we've talked about other areas where populations were interred during World War I in Canada and also in other parts of, the, uh, of Latin America. Um, and there's also a history of internment of Native Americans in um, the Trail of Tears, for example. So there is a history here in the Americas of doing these types of things. But think about, um, think about the similarities and differences here. There's one main difference that I want you to think about. Um, many of the Canadian citizens were deported back to Japan. And if you can imagine being a Canadian citizen who had been loyal, um, who, had a, who had gone into the internment camps, and then upon the war concluding, being sent back to Japan, basically being told unofficially that they were an enemy. Um, it's something to think about. So that concludes today's um, short lecture. There is a short video that I would like you to watch and post um, your answers on the discussion board. And I will see you soon. Hope you guys are doing well. Nessie and Bessie are still here. And they say hello. Have a good day.